Yeah. But I want to start off with just a couple limit things about limits to infinity first. So this is a reminder to everyone. There's kind of three different things, three different main things that happen with limits to infinity. So for example, if you have a limit as x goes to infinity, let's say 2x squared plus 3x or 5x squared plus 4x plus 1, we know that this limit is going to be 2 fifths. You can divide everything by x squared. And I think it is worth showing this work. So I divide everything on top and on bottom by the highest power of x in the denominator. I get 2 plus 3 over x over 5 plus 4 over x plus 1 over x squared. The things that are divided by x go to 0 since x is getting infinitely large. So I get 2 fifths. So the degrees are the same, right? The degree on the top is 2, the degree on the bottom is 2. The limit is quotient of leading coefficients. When the degree on top is lesser, and you have limit as x going to infinity, of say like 3x plus 1 over 8x cubed plus 7x plus 9, you're still going to divide by the largest power of x in the denominator. So that's going to be the limit as x goes to infinity, you divide everything by x cubed. So I'm going to get 3 over x squared plus 1 over x cubed. Again, I'm simplifying as I go, right? 3x over x cubed is 3 over x squared because one of the x's cancels. And on the, in the denominator, I get 8 plus 7 over x squared plus 9 over x cubed. Again, all the things that are divided by x squared or by a power of x go to 0. And what we're really doing here, like zero over eight, which is zero, is the way I kind of think of this more generally is we're dividing by the thing that's growing the fastest. Or another way of saying it is we're dividing by the dominating term. So, sure. Um, someone else sent a good question, which I think actually hmm, might be that one. Sure. Uh, sure. This one, this one kind of falls in line. But look at this limit. I'm going to change it just slightly, Jack. Um, limit as, actually, wait, I'm not there yet. Sorry, I'm not there yet. Limit as x goes to infinity. If the numerator is to a larger power, so say we have like, I don't know, x cubed plus 5x plus 1 over negative 2x squared plus x plus 3. You can make this work by dividing everything by x cubed, but it's easier to make it work if you divide everything by the highest power of x in the denominator. So this is one case where we're not dividing by everything that's going the fastest, but still close to it. And it just makes the calculations easier. So in this case, we make the limit as x goes to infinity, divide everything by x squared, I get x on top plus 5 over x plus 1 over x squared divided by dividing everything by x squared on the bottom, I get negative 2 plus 1 over x plus 3 over x squared. These Is that x cubed zero. 5x? Sorry, what was that? Is that x cubed plus 5x plus 1? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. Sorry, I only heard the 5x. So I was like, what? Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is x cubed plus 5x plus 1. So then all these things being divided by x to some power go to 0. But it's also important to remember that this x here is going to infinity, right? x is going to infinity. So I actually get positive infinity divided by negative 2. And a positive divided by a negative is a negative. So these are the three sorts of things that can happen. What happens when the limit is going to negative infinity? So for each of these, well, I should say, for the first two, the answer is still the same. So if we're going to infinity or negative infinity, we actually get the same result. So if x is going to plus or minus infinity, you're still going to get two fifths here because you're still going to do the same division. And you're still going to end up saying, well, these things, this 3 over x, this 4 over x, this 1 over x squared, they are all fractions that are getting really, really, really small because we're dividing by something that is very, very large. Whether it's positive or negatively large doesn't matter. It's still very large. Same deal here. 
when the degree on top is less than the degree on the bottom, you're going to get zero, whether or not you go to negative or positive infinity. Because, again, for the same reason, right? We divide everything by x cubed, and we end up getting things that are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. For this last one, though, it actually does matter sometimes whether it's a plus or minus infinity. So in this case, I'm going to change this just a little just to show you guys. If I was going to, instead of infinity plus or minus infinity, the work would still be the same, right? I'd still have plus or minus infinity here. But then this x is going to positive or negative infinity, depending on where what we're doing, right? So if we're going to negative infinity, we're going to get all right, of x plus the 5 over x plus the 1 over x squared over negative 2 plus 1 over x plus 3 over x squared. In this case, right, these things divided by something with x still go to 0. But now this x isn't going to positive infinity. It's going to negative infinity over negative 2. So this one ends up being positive infinity. So sometimes it's different. In fact, the next example I'm going to do is also be different as well. So these are both examples of functions that have a horizontal asymptote. For this one, this function has a horizontal asymptote of two fifths. For this one, since the limit to infinity or negative infinity is zero, this one has a horizontal asymptote of just y equals zero. This one does not have a horizontal asymptote because the function is not getting close to one particular number. If you graph it, to the right, as x goes to positive infinity, it would go down to negative infinity. If you graph it to the left, as x goes to negative infinity, it goes up to positive infinity. So if you're going to graph this one, I don't know exactly what this function looks like, but I know it does something like to the left, it's way up here, some stuff happens in the middle, to the down, to, to the right, it's way over there. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I do know that. Since the limit to infinity gives me negative infinity, as x goes that way, the function goes that way. And since the limit to negative infinity is positive infinity, as x goes that way, the y values go that way. It's going to drive me crazy. So, a couple of people have asked about a couple other things. So there are there are other functions that have kind of funkier limits, like to infinity. The following two, actually, so first we should really just say this. Um, I'm going to graph these, so I think it's easier to see it this way. If I graph f of x equal to e to the x, it looks like this. And the y-intercept is 0, 1. And there are two limits we can talk about. The limit as x goes to infinity of e to the x well, as x gets larger, the y values get larger. That's infinity. And the limit as x goes to negative infinity of e to the x. So as we as x goes to minus infinity, this graph gets closer and closer to zero. And those are things you kind of just need to stick in your head. I have them, I mean, I think of a graph. I also think of, at least for this one, if the power is getting bigger and bigger and bigger, then e to the power is also getting bigger and bigger, right? Because e to the x, like if, if x is getting larger, it's like e squared, e cubed, e to the fourth, e to the fifth, you're multiplying something by itself more and more times. And since it's larger than one, that product is going to get larger and larger and larger. On the other side, when x goes to negative infinity, you get e to the negative infinity power, which you could think of graphically and say, oh, well, I'm having something that's getting smaller. But you could also rewrite it as the limit as x goes to negative infinity of 1 over e to the negative x. And then negative x, well, since x is going to negative infinity, negative x is going to negative negative infinity, which is positive infinity. e to the infinity is super large. So 1 over e to the infinity is super small. That's another way you can think about that. And then the other way. So, so, so we, so I want to, Melody, to answer your question, there's no cited limits for infinity. 
you can ever only approach infinity from the left, right? If I'm going to infinity, right, we'll look at the number line, right? Infinity's out that way, infinity, right? I'm not, I can't come at infinity from this side because I'm not bigger than infinity. So we can only approach infinity from the left and negative infinity from the right. Um, but the other function I want to make you aware of is e to the negative x. So e to the negative x looks like this. And we can see that the limit as x goes to infinity of e to the negative x is zero. Because we can see graphically, oh yeah, it's getting close to zero. Or you can write it as the limit as x goes to infinity of one over e to the x. Denominator is getting super big. Entire fraction is getting super small. And then in a similar way, the limit as x goes to minus sorry, for infinity of e to the negative x. Well, as x goes to minus infinity, the function gets super big. Or you could just say, if I plug in, plug in negative infinity, e to the negative negative infinity is e to the infinity, which is super big. The reason I point this out, or the reason I want us to talk about this for a minute, is because then we might ask ourselves the following types of questions. And this is similar to, I think, well, not exactly the same, but similar to question three from discussion sheet three, I think, for guy. Um, so I want to talk about the function f of x equal to, oh, let me actually. Let me make sure I'm not super crazy with this example. And I want something a little different. This is similar, not quite the same. Let's say I've got 4e to the 6z plus 5e eh, to the negative z over 3e to the 2z plus, eh, sure, plus 6e to the negative 3z. Okay. And I want to know about if this has any horizontal asymptotes. I also want to know if there's any vertical asymptotes. We'll look at both. So let's talk about horizontal asymptotes. So when someone asks you, does this function have a horizontal asymptote? The question you should really hear is, oh, if I take the limit to either infinity or to negative infinity, do I get a real number? Not, right, not infinity, but like five or two or something like that. So we're going to take both because although rational, I just erased them, the rational functions that we deal with, if they have a horizontal asymptote, it's the same to the right or left. Other functions, especially things of ease. Oh, sorry, I used z because I was looking at the example. I was calling this f of z. Um, other things with e to the x or e to the z, you can have a different horizontal asymptote to the right than you have to the left. So we're going to look at the limit as x goes, sorry, as z goes to infinity of this gnarly looking expression. And here is my word of advice that I was talking about previously. You want to divide everything by the dominating term, by the thing that is going to be the biggest, the fastest. And in this case, it's e to the 6z, right? That is the thing that is growing largest most quickly. E to the 2z is also getting big, but not as fast as that. And e to the negative z and e to the negative 3z are actually getting closer and closer to zero. So we're going to divide everything by e to the 6z. So we have the limit as z goes to infinity of 4e to the 6z divided by e to the 6z plus 5e to the negative z divided by e to the 6z over 3e to the 2z divided by e to the 6z plus 6e to the negative 3z divided by e to the 6z. And then we're going to simplify just like we did before. Well, kind of like, right? Not exactly like we did before, but more. So I personally, I personally prefer to have positive powers of z if I can. Or positive, well, positive powers of e to the whatever. Like, so I would prefer to write, well, this first term is just going to be four, but this next term 
When you divide e to the negative z by e to the 6z, you subtract the powers. And negative z minus 6z is minus 7z. So you could either write this as 5e to the negative 7z, or you could write it as 5 over e to the positive 7z. And I kind of like that better, even though I didn't write it that way. I'll do that in the denominator. So in the denominator, 3e to the 2z over e to the 6z. Again, I could write that as 3 times e to the negative 4z, or I could write it as 3 over e to the positive 4z. Either way is fine. Same deal here. 6e to the negative 3z divided by e to the 6z. I could write that as 6 times e to the negative 9z, or 6 over e to the positive 9z. Sometimes when I do this method, sorry, can you like, speak up just a little bit? Oh, sorry. Sometimes when I do this method and for like finding the infinite, uh, finding the limit for negative infinity, I get like a number. It's always like one over something plus infinity. Like, so if it doesn't give that, it doesn't give me an answer. So what's that? Like it doesn't give me an answer. So we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay, thank you. We're, dead, yeah, we're definitely gonna do the limit to infinity to negative infinity. So in this case, we know that if z is going to infinity, e to the negative something times z is going to go to zero, right? Because of the graphs, right? e to the negative x or e to the negative 7x, right? That's still going to go to zero as x goes to infinity. So this is still going to go to zero as z goes to infinity. I think it's easier to see it if we write it like this. Right, instead of writing three times e to the negative four z, I think it is much easier to see that if z is going to infinity, e to the four z is also going to infinity, and three divided by something infinitely large is going to zero. You could also say the same thing here. If this was six over e to the nine z, it's very clear I have something that's divided by something that's infinitely large, so it's going to zero, or e to the negative nine z is going to zero as z goes to infinity. And I have made an error. So, so I made an error, that's all right. So look what happens here. Shoot, that's a problem, right? We are kind of not happy about this. So here's, so I kind of set up a problem that I hadn't actually checked out ahead of time. That happens sometimes, it's okay. There's still a way to deal with this, even though it looks terrible. So here's, a, here's actually, here's what you could say at this point if you really wanted to. You could say the top's going to positive four, the bottom's going to zero, and it is always positive. So you could just say this is going to infinity. Now, I think that doesn't feel super great. So I'm going to show you how to actually see what it's going to, as opposed to just kind of hand waving it here. So let's back up for a second. I'll leave this one here. Uh, sure. We will get to the negative infinity side, but I want to kind of show you what's up. So this is actually a prime example of how you should listen to yourself even when you don't think you should. So here's the problem again. Limit as z goes to infinity of 40 to the 6z plus 5 to the negative z. Don't worry, this is gonna work out great. 3 to the 2z plus 6 to the negative 3z. Okay, so what I really should have done, instead of dividing by the thing that's getting the largest the fastest, <clears throat> is I should have divided by the thing that's getting the largest the fastest that's in the denominator, right? Just like in the previous examples, I should have, did, like when we had the, the x to a power ones, I divided by the thing in the denominator that was largest. That is also what I should be doing here, because then I won't run into this problem of having something divided by zero at the end. So I should really be dividing by e to the 2z. So I'm going to do, I'm not going to show all the work this time. I'm just going to talk it out. This is going to be the limit if z goes to infinity of, so divided by e to the 2z, I'm going to get 4e to the 4z. Dividing by e to the 2z here, 
I'm going to get 5e e to the negative 3z dividing by e to the 2z here I just get 3 and dividing by e to the 2z here I get 6e e to the negative 5z or 6 over e to the positive 5z. And now what happens? Well, this goes to 0 and this goes to 0. Right, e to the negative three z goes to zero as z goes to infinity, over e to the five z goes to zero as well. So I'm left with something that goes to infinity over three, which is infinitely large. So if you find yourself, just one sec. If you find yourself getting into this place where you have something divided by zero, it means you probably divided by something that was a little too big and you want to back up a little. Go ahead. That one goes to infinity because uh, e isn't negative, or the power is four z, not negative something z. Yeah. So 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 this, yeah, this one goes to infinity because you have e to a positive coefficient of z, right? This exponent, right? Z is going to infinity. Four times z is also going to infinity, and e to the infinity is also going to infinity. So if e is going to a negative exponent, or if e is on the denominator, then it's going to equal zero? As long as you're going to infinity. That's so, so really, you have to kind of think about just where is z going through. If z is going to infinity, e to the infinity goes to infinity. e to the negative infinity goes to zero, right? So I wrote it this way to show, oh, look, I have e to the negative 3 times infinity is e to the negative infinity, which goes to zero. Here I have 6 over e to the infinity, which is going to 0. But I could also have written this one as 6 times e to the negative 5z. What if it was e? What if it was like a number over e um, and like a positive number to z to infinity? So like, what if it was e, like something over e to the positive infinity? Like, what would that get us? That would get a zero? Yeah, well, that's exactly what we have right here, right? 6 over e to the 5z. And if it was a negative, and if it was like the opposite, if that was a negative infinity, it would give us a positive number? So, so if, if instead, so let's actually, so let's look at the limit as z goes to negative infinity. And I'm going to use the same kind of idea as before. But here is where you have to be extra, extra careful. I want to divide everything. Now, I, mean, I am going to be extra careful in that I want to divide everything by the thing the denominator is getting the base. So let me ask you, of these two terms, which one's getting the base? e to the 2z or e to the negative 3z as z goes to negative infinity? Uh, you pick 2z. Actually not. E to the 2z is going to 0. E to the negative 3z is going to get infinitely large because z is going to negative infinity. And negative 3 times negative infinity is positive infinity. And e to the infinity gets infinitely large. I wouldn't say radical necessarily here because these aren't radicals. But we divide by the largest, like the thing that's the, the power that's the biggest, or Right, the thing that is getting the largest, and that really is contextual, right? It depends on where this is going. Um, yeah, I do. So, the problem with the one I came up with on the fly here is the answer is not going to be super interesting because, because of what I did. So, I'm going to modify this one just slightly to get a more interesting answer. Yeah, so let's make it instead. I'm going to change the power a bit. Let's say we had e to the 4z and e to the 4z here and e to the negative 3z and e to the negative 3z there. So that the positive powers and the negative powers are the same. And I want to do it this way because just kind of shows a little more thing. So again, I'm still holding to my original thought that I want to divide by the thing that is the largest. And the thing that's the largest as z goes to negative infinity is e to the negative 3z, right? e to the negative 3z 
looks like this. E to the positive 4z looks like this. But as we go to negative infinity, right, e to the negative 3z is much bigger than e to the positive 4z. Can you uh, be able to solve a similar problem to that? Or what? Or would, you, would you have the time to solve like one of the homework problems like similar to that? This is very similar to a homework problem. I think this is a good example of the homework problem. I'm still having like a problem with one of them. And it's like, it's the same method. Sure. So, so I think this is a good example. Let's do this one. Okay. So I'm going to divide everything by e to the negative three. So here's the limit as e goes to negative infinity of 4e to the 4z divided by e to the negative 3z plus 5e to the negative 3z divided by e to the negative 3z divided by 3e to the 4z over e to the negative 3z plus 6e to the negative 3z over e to the negative 3z. Okay. When you, when you divide these things, you subtract the powers. 4z minus minus 3z is 4z plus 3z, which is 7z. So this is going to be the limit as z goes to negative infinity of 4e to the 7z plus 5, right? These just cancel out. Over on the bottom, I have 3e to the 7z plus 6. Wait, so when we're going to negative infinity, instead of doing the largest um, like exponent in the denominator, we do the smallest one? Yeah, that's another way you could say it for sure. Because the smallest one is the one that's getting biggest fastest. Even if they're both positive, right? If these are both, if like, if this was e to the 2z and e to the 2z, and I was going to negative infinity, I would divide everything by e to the 2z. So yeah, you want to divide, if you're going to negative infinity, and it's one like this, where it's e to the something, right? It's not like a rational function with polynomials. But if it's e to the things, and you're going to negative infinity, yes, you want to divide by the smallest power in the denominator, or e to the smallest power. So this ends up being pi over six, because this term here, as z goes to negative infinity, this goes to zero, and the same thing here. Um, wait, how did you get like the seven z? For because was that like a nine or was that a four? That's a four. And then we're writing isn't always the best. So this here says 4e to the 4z divided by e to the negative 3z. And to get this term here, I subtracted those powers, and 4z minus minus 3z is positive 7z. Okay. Okay. Um, are there other questions about this particular problem? Okay, so. I do think there's a couple other questions we should look at. So, not that we shouldn't continue to talk about limits to infinity, but there are other types of limits. So, I think we should move into talking about limits as x approaches any number. For example, I could ask you, 
what's the limit as x approaches three of, I don't know, x squared minus five x plus one. So when you read this statement, well, first of all, reading it the right way is, is, is a little important. This says the limit as x approaches three of the function x squared minus five x plus one. And all this is asking you is, what is this function getting closer and closer to as x is getting closer and closer to three? So we could graph the function. I don't really want to graph the function, but we could. Right? It looks, I don't know, vaguely like this. Probably. But what they're really saying is, okay, as x is getting closer to three, what's this function getting closer to? Well, as we move closer and closer, let's say three is right there. Right, the function is getting closer and closer and closer and closer to some y value. And in this case, we could just plug in three for the function and figure out what y value we're closer to. So in this case, you can say, oh, well, that's going to be three squared minus five minus three plus one, which is nine minus 15 plus one, which is negative nine. And a lot of times this is true. If you're trying to find a limit as x approaches some number, you can just substitute that number in for x into the function that you're taking the limit of and see what the function is. But things are never always this easy, right? Usually things are going to be more challenging. Someone's going to ask you a question like, okay, what's the limit as x approaches three of something more like x squared minus nine over x minus three? And then we can't just substitute in three. Right? If I plug in three for x, I get nine minus nine on top, and three minus three on the bottom, and zero over zero is undefined. It doesn't mean the limit exists, right? If you just, so I really shouldn't say this is equal to zero over zero. I should say if you plug in three, we see that it would be zero over zero, and zero over zero is undefined. I do want to really, really disabuse anyone of the notion that zero over zero is necessarily equal to one, right? It could be one, it could actually be anything, because really what this says is zero divided by zero. So the question we're asking is, how many times does zero go into zero? Well, you might say one, and I might say five, and Krista might say 17, and Melody might say 26, and we'd all be right, because zero goes into zero 26 times, and zero goes into zero 17 times, and zero goes into zero a million times. So this is even more specifically than being undefined. It's actually what's called an indeterminate form. Because depending on what you're dealing with, it can actually take on any value. So you're right, Melody. We could totally plug in a number that's really, really close to what x is approaching. And sometimes that would be very helpful. For example, here, we could totally plug in numbers like x is equal to, I don't know, we could start with, let's, try, let's make a table. So, if I plug in say x equal to four, so I'm not going to work, make a table. If I plug in four, here I'm going to get seven. Right, 16 minus nine is seven, over four minus three is one, seven, one, seven. And then I can pick smaller numbers, like I could say, or I should say numbers closer to three. I could plug in 3.5. And 3.5 squared minus nine, or 3.5 minus three, ends up being 6.5. I'm not really doing the math in my head. I'm using a trick. I'll show you the trick in a second. If I plug in 3.1, 3.1 squared, okay, that is 9.61 minus 9 is 0.61 over 3.1 minus 3 is 0.1, and 6.1 divided by 0.1 is, or sorry, 0.61 divided by 0 0.1 is 6.1. You can do the math in your head. Yeah, exactly, Jack, right? You would factor and simplify. Because x squared minus nine over x minus three is equal to x minus three times x plus three over x minus three. And as long as x is not equal to three, 
we can cancel these out and say it's just equal to x plus three. So yeah, that's what I'm really doing. I'm saying, oh, if I plug in 3.1, 3.1 plus 3 is 6.1. Okay, so that's the problem. And we can keep, right, we can go to like 3.0001 and we get 6.0001. So it definitely appears here that the limit is 6 because the values of this function are getting closer and closer and closer to 6 as the x values are getting closer and closer and closer to 3. Now, the idea here is the following. When you have a zero over zero limit like this, you can typically employ some rules of algebra to evaluate it. So if I was actually trying to evaluate the limit as x approaches three of x squared minus nine over x minus three, I want to stress, I cannot stress this enough. This limit as x approaches three is saying, what is happening to this function as x gets very, very close, but not equal to three? And the but not equal to part is actually really, really important because then I can do this. I can say, well, I can factor the top. And then I can say, well, this limit, I can cancel these. I'm going to talk about canceling these. So this is the limit as x approaches 3 of x plus 3. Okay, so now I have an important question to ask you guys. And it's a, it's, a, it's a question that does have some nuance. Are these functions f of x equal to x squared minus 9 over x minus 3 and g of x equal to x plus 3, are these functions the same? Are they equal to each other? It's a good question. So how do we know functions are equal? They have to be the same everywhere we evaluate them. Are these functions the same everywhere we evaluate them? Well, almost, but not everywhere. Because here, g of 3 is equal to 6. And here, f of 3 is undefined. Um, Emily, I think we don't get to use L'Hopital's rule for quite a while. I think eventually it's on the table, but I don't think it is this far. So I would say hold off on L'Hopital's rule, right? Because you can definitely, I mean, it is definitely possible to use L'Hopital's rule to evaluate the limit, but I'm pretty sure most of your 17 professors, probably all of them, are nixed on the L'Hopital's rule for now. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't worry about it because you don't have to know this word. I don't, I'm pretty, yeah, I'm pretty I, and I think in the 17 series, sometimes they don't cover it at all. So yeah, I would, I would definitely, L'Hopital's rule is not on the table for a while. Um, so but what I was saying here is these functions are the same almost everywhere, but they're not the same everywhere. So these functions aren't the same. But the only place they're not the same, this is really kind of why I was stressing the everywhere but three thing a second ago is these are the same everywhere except for three. So this expression, and this expression are the same everywhere except for three. And when you take the limit as x approaches three, you care about what this function is doing really, really close to, but not at three. So as far as we're concerned, these expressions are totally the same because the limit says, what's this function doing exactly close to three? Well, since this function and this function are the same everywhere except for three, then they're getting close to the same three. So the same thing everywhere except for three. So we can say, well, this one's getting close to six. So so is this one. And the way I did it here was I just substituted in three. So three plus three was six. I didn't have to make the whole table that we just did a second ago. Let's see that it's actually close to four to six. Um, and yeah. So the difference between these two functions, I think I can graph here for you all. So, um, here's y equals x plus 3. And here's y equals x squared minus 9 over x minus 3. And the only difference 
difference between these two functions is that this function doesn't have the point three comma six. It's got all the other same points except for that one. But as I will stress many, many, many times, the limit doesn't care what's happening at the point. This function, as x gets closer and closer and closer to three, the y values get closer and closer and closer and closer to six. The same thing is true for that function. Here, as the x values get closer and closer and closer to three, the corresponding y values get closer and closer and closer to six. So it is perfectly correct to say what we said over there. I shouldn't even have, I don't want to write anything. I'm going to write anything. The limit as x approaches three of x squared minus nine over x minus three is equal to six. I want to stress this expression doesn't say something about what the function is equal to. We're not saying this function ever equals it. It doesn't. What this equality says is this. So another way of writing this, in fact, is that as x approaches three, x squared minus nine over x minus three approaches six. That's an alternative, more long way of writing the same meaning. So this and this have the same meaning. The function can be closer to six as the y values will be closer to three. Yeah, exactly, Jack. Yeah. So yes, so I know it took a long time to kind of do this relatively easy example where you can just cancel things. But the point is that you can just cancel things, right? You can cancel the thing here that's causing a problem because the, fun, the limit doesn't actually care what's happening at the problem point of three. So if I have a factor of x minus three and a factor of x minus three, I can totally cancel that. Um, when I was trying, like I know, I now I get it because I had to figure it out because I was doing homework. So I figured out you had to make sure you do the factoring part for it to work. Because like when I was trying to do it and I was like, oh, I'll put like it all over like the X to like do it the other way we were learning. And then I was getting like the wrong answer. So it's like you have to factor to make sure it's like. Well, and so I would say generally it really depends on what kind of problem we are being attacked with, right? I mean, for example, if I have say the limit as x approaches 2 of x cubed to minus 8 over x plus 2, this one's not a problem. I can just say, well, if I plug in 2, what do I get? You get 0 on top, I get 4 on the bottom, 0 divided by 4 is 0. So this function, as x gets closer to 2, this function gets closer and closer to zero. And you can see that if you plug in values like 1.9 or 2.1, right, the top would be very small and the bottom would be very close to four. However, if we change things up and make x cubed minus eight over x minus two, then we have to work. Because now if you plug in two, you get one of those zero over zero indeterminate forms. And so, when you have a zero over zero indeterminate form, there are lots of different ways to try and tackle it. The first and foremost method, well, in fact, the, what I usually call my methods here are the algebra methods. Do some algebra. The first kind of algebra that always comes to my head is just can I factor in cancel? Can I factor this? Sure, I can. The numerator, so whenever you're factoring the difference of cubes, and this is x cubed minus 2 cubed, it's x minus 2 times x squared plus 2 times x plus 2 squared. All over x minus 2. And then and then since this limit doesn't care what's happening at two, this expression and this expression, B 
these are always the same except for two. Right? At two, this is a number. At two, this is zero over zero. If we're else than two, they're going to be the same. When you plug in three, these parts cancel. Plug in three here, plug in three here, it's the same. You plug in five, these parts cancel. This part here, this part here are the same. You plug in five. So these exact, our expressions are exactly the same everywhere except for two. And so if you're taking the limit of x to the two, it's perfectly fine to cancel the x minus two. So it doesn't equal zero. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, the, the other one, yeah, Anna, the first one did equal zero. Zero over four is zero. Zero divided by anything not zero is zero. This one's going to be two squared plus two times two plus four, which is 12. So when you have a zero or zero type of limit, one thing you can try and do is if you can factory cancel things, factory cancel things. And that's not the only thing though. Sometimes you have to use other algorithms like let's have the limit as t goes to six of I don't know five minus the square root of t plus nineteen over uh, or t squared minus thirty six. Yeah, no, it's not like yeah, that. Yeah, so. I can definitely see I can factor. Well, I should, so I should back up. I should listen to my own advice. Before I start thinking about factoring and canceling or doing anything, yeah, I'm going to use the conjugate, but before I use the conjugate, I should make sure I actually have to, right? So let me, I'm going to change the problem. Oh, I don't want you to film that way. Um, right? Let's say I had a plus right there for just a second. I'm going to go back to the problem, right? If I had a plus there, I should check that if I plug it in, it goes to the number. Right, if I plug it in here, I plug in six, six plus 19 is 25, so 25 is five, five minus five is zero. And if it was a plus on the bottom, right, 36 plus 36 is 72. So the limit written like this would just be zero. And using the conjugate, although is not wrong, would be extra work I wouldn't need to do. So always, always, before you start applying algebraic methods or anything really, plug in what T is approaching or X is approaching and make sure you don't just get a number. If you get a zero over zero, then do some work. If you get a zero over not zero, your answer is zero. Or if you get a non-zero over non-zero, your answer is whatever that number is. Okay, so now, yes. So now I see that if I plug in t equal to six, oh, I definitely get zero over zero. So then you're right. I'm going to multiply by the conjugate, the conjugate of the square root thing. It's technically this has a conjugate too, right? The conjugate of this is t squared plus 36. But the point of multiplying by the conjugate is to get rid of the root. Because there's no way I can, there's no way I can simplify this with the square root though. It's problematic. So I'm gonna multiply by five plus the square root of t plus 19 over five plus the square root of t plus 19. So the whole Thing that multiply by the conjugate is you want to multiply the conjugates. So when you multiply conjugates together, you get the first thing squared, so you get five squared, minus the second thing squared, the square root of t plus 19 squared. And the middle terms cancel out, right? You would get five times the square root of t plus 19 minus five times the square root of t plus 19. And those would totally cancel out, so we're not going to write it. The bottom, I don't want to multiply out. Right? This, all right, because what I really want to do, actually, I do want this factor. I want this left on its own, and I want to factor t squared minus 36 as t minus 6 times t plus 6. Because I know if and I know if I'm getting a zero over zero when I plug in six, I should be able to factor out a t minus six from the top and the bottom. Right. If whatever you're plugging in the number is giving you zero, you should be able to factor out your variable minus that number. It's like the fundamental theorem of algebra. If you plug in a number and you get zero, x minus that number or t minus that number is a factor. Okay. So I have a limit as t approaches six of, let's see. So this is 25 on top minus parentheses t plus 19. So this becomes. 
25 minus p minus nineteen. So that's going to be six minus p on top. So I've got six minus p on top over t minus six times t plus six times five plus the square root of t plus nineteen. And now we have a small other issue. So it's six minus t and t minus six don't exactly cancel out. They're not the same. You can address this in one of two ways. You can either say, well, I can factor out a negative one from top, right? I can rewrite this as negative one times negative six plus t, which is just the t minus six, right? That's the same as that. The other way to do it is just to say, these do cancel out, but when you divide six minus t by t minus six, they leave you with a negative one. Right, when you subtract things in the opposite order, they are always opposite signs, right? Six minus eight and eight minus six, that's negative two over two, that's negative one. Or six minus 80 over 80 minus six is negative 74 over 74, which is negative one, right? As long as t isn't six, six minus t over t minus six is always negative one. And so then you can say, oh, great. We've got negative one over, and I'm going to plug in six for the remaining t's. So six plus six is 12 times five plus the square root of six plus 19. So that's five plus five, that's 10. 12 times 10 is 120. So I get negative one over 120. So, Another algebraic method we have for dealing with a zero over zero type of limit is to use the conjugate. All right. I'm just on on that last one was the final limit one over one twenty. Negative one over 120. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sure. I'm slowly working my way back around some of the questions that were asked earlier. Okay. Limit as x approaches negative 12 of three over x plus one fourth over x plus k. So in this case, again, there's not really any simplifying we can do yet. Or we can simplify this, we really have to multiply by a common denominator. So there's actually kind of two different ways to do this. One way is to write this as the limit as x goes to negative 12 of 3 over x times 4 over 4 plus 1 over 4 times x over x all over x plus 12. Another way to do this is the limit as x approaches negative 12 of 3 over x plus 1 over 4 over x plus 12 and then multiply that entire fraction by 4x over 4x. Either way, I'm using a common denominator. Either way, I'm going to get to the same place. It's just that it looks a little different. I feel like, so personally, this seems more logical. I'm like, well, yeah, I'm just going to get a common denominator and add the things together. That makes sense. This is computationally slightly more difficult. This seems a little less logical, like you have to know the trick but this is slightly computationally easier. So that's why I prefer to do it this way, even though this way seems more sensible. But let's look at both. So this way, I get the limit as x goes to negative 12. Uh, let's see, so this becomes 12 over 4x plus x over 4x all over x plus 12. I combine those together, so I have the limit as x approaches negative 12 
of 12 plus x over 4x. And here's the part that usually throws people off. Instead of dividing by x plus 12, I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal, which is 1 over x plus 12. That's the part that's usually computationally a little bit hard. Um, and then what happens is this x plus 12 and this x plus 12 can cancel out. And so you get the limit as x goes to negative 12 of 1 over 4x, which is 1 over 4 times negative 12, which is negative 1 over 48. It's a perfectly fine way to do it. You do it this other way, though, it's a little bit easier. You do it this way, you distribute this 4x to each of those terms. So you get the limit as x goes to negative 12. 4x times 3 over x, the x is canceled. And 4 times 3 is 12. And then 4x times 1 over 4, the 4 is canceled. And 1 4 times 4x gives you just x over x plus 12 times 4x. So would you only distribute the 4x to the numerators? Correct. And so this is kind of a, this is kind of a thing that we see happening often, like with the conjugate, right? With the conjugate here, I didn't multiply at the bottom because this isn't the conjugate of that. Same deal kind of here. I'm only going to multiply at the top because the 4x is the common denominator of these fractions. Whereas the 4x isn't really related to this term at all. Also, I know I want to cancel out an x plus 12 because negative 12 plus 12 is, what, is what's giving me zero in the denominator. So I'm always like, if I see something that is becoming zero when I plug in whatever x is going to, that's usually the thing I'm looking to cancel. And I want to leave it alone so I can easily cancel it out. But you could multiply this out and get 4x squared plus 48x. And then in the next step, you probably factor it back out. So you get that x plus 12 plus 4x. We don't want to do more work than we have to do. Um, so then we get, so then this 12 plus x and this x plus 12, those are the same. So this cancel out. So the limit as x goes to negative 12 of 1 over 4x. And that's just what we had down here. That's going to be negative 1 over 48. So either way you want to do this is fine. I think this way is a little bit easier. But what do you like this? So the third thing we often see is we have a 0 over 0. And there's algebra to do is we use a common denominator. Okay. So, sorry, like for the red one, how come like once you got to like the four x on the bottom, how come you couldn't just like plug in the negative twelve and you had to do that additional step? You mean like this step here? Like the one before it, because you get like four x like in the beginning, and you can't you can't you just like plug in the negative twelve then? You probably could. So people get a little picky about when you write the limit. Um, I so if you wanted to, yeah, you could go straight to saying this is equal to. 1 over 4 times negative 12, which is negative 48. Okay. I think we uh, I, I saw a couple limit questions you guys had earlier. So let me, yeah, let me look at. So I might have a question about question four from the third discussion. The question four is asking you to sketch a graph that has all these things going on. So let's look at this and kind of talk about it. Because so I think this is a good, and this is a good question. And your your example is obviously very different than mine. So here is the question. They want us to sketch a graph that has all these limits. So the limit as x approaches two of f of x is equal to infinity. The limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left. Sorry, negative 3 from the right is equal to also infinity. The limit as x approaches negative 3 from the left of f of x is equal to 
is negative infinity. Limit as x approach is negative infinity. How about the x is zero. Limit as x approach is positive infinity. Is that all just one question? All just one question. I believe in it. That's the way I'm reading it. Yeah. Sketch a graph of an example of a function that satisfies all of the given conditions. Which is not as hard as it looks. It just looks hard. So let's talk about the points we kind of need to be aware of. We need to be aware of what's happening. X equals two, X equals negative three, zero, and then what's going on to the left and to the right. So here's what I know so far. I know that f of zero is zero. I also know that, so if I have the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x equal to one, that means I have what kind of feature? If I go all the way out to infinity and the limit is one, that means as I go further and further to the right, my graph is getting closer and closer to one. What do we call that kind of thing on a graph? Horizontal asymptote. asymptote. Exactly. Yeah, you guys are probably typing it, and I'm just not all the way down in the chat because there's a million things on my computer. Yeah, exactly. So we know that to the right, we have a horizontal asymptote of y equals one. And then we also know, similarly to the left, as x goes to negative infinity, the function is getting closer and closer to zero. So, and you guys never draw this asymptote because it's all the axis, but we have y equals zero as a horizontal asymptote to the left. So we know that whatever's happening way out on the other side, our function should be getting closer and closer to this, either like this or like this, and same that it's getting closer like this. Okay. So then we need to look at what's happening at, let's say, the two. Actually, let's do negative three first. So this says, as I approach negative three from the right-hand side, my function is getting infinitely large. Okay, so here's negative three right here. And so it's saying, as I get closer and closer to negative three, my function is going to get infinitely large. That looks like I've got a a vertical asymptote there, All right? If I'm approaching negative three from the right and the function is blowing up to infinity, that means I have a vertical asymptote. And the same sort of thing from the left, except from the left hand side, right? The next word is negative three from the left. My function is getting negatively large. So from the left hand side, I'm not going up to infinity, I'm going down to negative infinity. Okay, so I can probably start filling in a couple things. I would probably make this hit right here. But you can make your graph totally right. You could you could make it right. You kind of just have to have at least three things. You could also do this if you want. You say, well, I'm going to make it go like, so it goes through negative two and then comes back and does that, right? You can do whatever you want, as long as you have the thing that you're asking for. And then, so on this side, right, you could, you can say, well, my horizontal axis is zero. So I'm going to do this. I'm going to say it goes like this. Totally okay to cross the horizontal asymptote. We do it all the time. Okay. But you could also just do that, right? If you want to. So the only other thing we have to worry about is what's happening at two. So just like at negative three, at two, we're going to have a vertical asymptote because as we're getting closer to two, the function is getting infinitely large. Now, the difference is that at two, it just says the limit as x approaches two is infinity, which means either from the right or from the left, they're both going up to infinity. So we're doing this and that. So the easiest thing would probably just be like, say, okay, well, that's going to connect up like that. And then this one, you could just make it go down like that, or you could do something wacky like, like that. This has all the features. The limit to negative infinity is zero. The limit to positive infinity is one. F of zero is zero. The limit as x approaches two is infinity. 
The limit as x approaches negative three from the right is infinity. The limit as x approaches negative three from the left is negative three. Uh, I had a question. Yeah. Well, the f of one equals zero. What did that mean when? Oh, that, I, that says f of zero equals zero. I thought. Oh, okay. No, yeah. it's okay. Zero equals zero. That makes sense now. Yeah, if it was f of one equals zero, this would not be good. Okay, I feel like there was another question that kind of went with this. Okay. I think we're in, so I think I'm gonna have to wait on the sine x over x kind of question. We'll talk about that next class along with um, along with the squeeze theorem, because it deals with the squeeze theorem. I had a question about the graph. Sure. Um so the one where the line like it looks like a parabola would that just be a parabola do we have to make it look like you can make it look like whatever you want so so you could have just then said it does this right you could have done that instead okay i'm just making sure i, I made my graph kind of extra because i want to make it fun but <laughs> you have to have the things they ask for Okay. I do want to point out, and this is actually a common kind of misconception. The only things that are actually parabolas are quadratics, right? So y equals you know x squared plus five x plus six. That's a parabola. It has a nice parabolic shape. There are lots of other things that have parabolic shapes in them sometimes, like this graph here. But this graph is definitely not a parabola, right? There's lots of other stuff going on. So just want to make that clear. Because I've definitely like I've definitely seen people talk about like the secant graph, which I don't know if you guys are aware of. But the secant, the graph of secant kind of looks like like this, where you have things that do this and then this and then this, and it kind of looks like a bunch of parabolas. They're not really parabolas, is what I'm trying to say. So you only get parabolas if it's actually parabolic. Otherwise, things just kind of look like parabolas. Okay, um, thank you. You're very welcome. And there was another question I wanted to make sure I got to. So I do think, yeah, so let's go back. Look at this limit question. It's not the sign one. So again, I think with only 10 minutes, I don't really have enough time to say all the things about like sine of six x over four x that I want to say. So I think we should leave that till next time. Maybe, maybe not. We'll see. But I do want to look at this. The limit as x goes to zero of one over x minus one over x squared plus x. I'm assuming. You meant like this, right? Where that whole second part was in the denominator. Sorry, I used x's instead of t's. This is the question you asked, Jack, about what? Yeah. Was like that, where that's all in the denominator? I think, let me check real quick. Sure. I mean, I guess I could just look in the book, I think. Yeah. Sure. So, this actually kind of brings up something else. So we'll come back to this in a second. And in fact, it actually goes right along with this. Kind of. So the limit, these limits, you know, where the limit was equal to infinity, those what gave us vertical asymptotes. And we get a vertical asymptote when the limit as x approaches the number is infinity. This one's a little more complicated, but we'll come back to it. But let's say that's something like the limit as x approaches, let's do, yeah, let's look at both sides. As x approaches 2 from either side of 3 over x minus 2. So I want to point out first and foremost, this is not a 0 over 0 type of limit. All right, by plugging 2, I don't get 0 over 0. What I do get is I get 3 over 0. Which isn't a real number, which is why I often write it in quotes. So you could make it if you wanted to, right? You could start plugging in values. I'm going to erase this part over here. Sorry, I know we're low on time, but like I could say, you know, I could plug in three for x and get three over one, which is three. I could plug in 2.1 and get 3 over 0.1, which is 30. 
or I could do 2.01 and get 3 over 0 0.01, which is 1 one hundred, which is 300. And we see, I think, that as the x values get closer and closer to 2, the y values are getting really stupid big. And that's going to happen, right? And so I say this a lot. I'm going to say it again right now. When you have fractions, if the denominator is getting large, the fraction is getting small, right? We saw that in the beginning of class today with all those limits as x went to infinity, right? like three over x squared, and that got small because the denominator got big. Well, the, the inverse relationship is also true. If the denominator is getting small, the fraction is getting large, maybe negatively large, but definitely large. So here we can see that as x approaches two from the right, meaning the side of two that's a little bigger than two, the denominator is positive. So I just wrote three over zero with a plus sign of a superscript. And that's going to be positive infinity. On the other side, if x is approaching two from the left, let's say like if x is 1.9, where I get three over negative 0.1, which is negative 30, or 1.99, where I get three over negative 0 0.01, which is negative 300, et cetera. We can see that as we approach two from the left, the values are getting infinitely large, but they are negatively infinitely large. And that's because here, if you're thinking about a number that's a tiny bit smaller than two, the numerator is still three, but the number smaller than two minus two is going to be slightly negative. So I write a zero with a minus sign of a superscript. And a positive over a negative is going to be a negative infinity. So here's the way I think about limits like this, where you have a number over zero. It's going to be some sort of infinity. And type of infinity depends fully on what sign things are. So what time do I got? Yeah, I got time. So, for example, I might ask, what's the limit as x approaches mm, two of, sorry, let me, um, yeah, of x squared over 4x minus x squared. Is that what I really want? Yeah, it is. Okay. So written like this is actually, so really I want to look at both sides. I want to look at the limit as x approaches 2 from the right and the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. And so here, if I plug in two from the right, I get four on top and I get zero on the bottom. And the issue here is with the way it's written, I don't actually know if the denominator is positive or negative. Right? So I'm thinking about like plugging like 2.1. What's bigger? Four times 2.1 or 2.1 cubed? You have to factor. You need to write this as the limit as x approaches two of x squared times. From the denominator, I can factor out an x. I'm left with 4 minus x squared, which factors further as 2 minus x times 2 plus x. So now I can see that when I plug in the number slightly larger than 2, my numerator is still 4. My denominator is 2 times a slightly positive number times a positive number. So the whole thing is positive on the bottom. On the other hand, if I plug in, if I'm approaching two from the left, sorry, I should have written, I should have written my x squared over four x minus x cubed here. The top is still going to four. The denominator now is going to, let's see if x is approaching two from the left. So x is going to two, which is positive. Two minus x is going to zero, but it's going to be, oh, I made a mistake. I made a small mistake. When x is approaching 2 from the right, 2 minus 2 is slightly negative. OK, 
because I'm a little bigger than two, and two minus two over two is that negative. So that actually should have been negative down here, which means overall this is a negative infinity. And this one, if I pick the number of slightly smaller than two, positive, positive, because two minus the number smaller than two is positive, positive. I would also mention that the left hand, sorry, the right hand limit is negative infinity. So we have a word class built like the like, like this, and the left hand limit is positive infinity. But the overall limit as x approaches two doesn't exist because they're not the same sort of infinity. So just be aware that if you have a limit that's double sided, if the right hand side and left hand side aren't the same sort of infinity, we would say that the limit didn't exist. Okay, so let me get back to the question that started this whole conversation. So just want to say again, generally, if you have a non zero number divided by zero, your limit's either going to be infinity, negative infinity, or if it's double sided and the different sides are different types of infinity, not exist. Those are the only three options if you have a non zero number divided by zero. That's it. So, number zero is going to be infinity, negative infinity, or does not exist. The whole story there. It's great. So, I want to come back to this question because it does require a little bit more effort. The problem with this. Is it infinity minus infinity? Okay. This is going to some sort of infinity. This is going to some sort of infinity. Infinity minus infinity is here is the as indeterminate. Common denominator is the way to go. Right? If you're subtracting fractions and you can't just subtract them, that is easily, maybe not easily, but is often an obvious first thing to try. It might not work. Sometimes things don't work. We still try them. So I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as x goes to zero of one over x times x squared plus x over x squared plus x minus one over x squared plus x times x over x. And then I write the limit x goes to zero. Uh, let's see, x squared plus x minus x over x times x squared plus x. Cancel those. We have limit is x goes to zero of x squared over x times x squared plus x. If I try to plug in zero now, what do I get? Uh, indeterminate, probably. Right, I get sadness. Zero over zero. So I try to simplify. In this case, I can definitely simplify. So I want to really, really caution you guys. This is not the time. Well, no, no, that's not exactly true. I don't. So what I want to, what I want to warn you. I know we're out of time, but what I want to warn you against is this mistake, where you say the limit as x goes to zero of like two x squared plus one over three x squared plus five x plus two. I've seen people say that this is equal to two thirds because they're using the rule. This is not two thirds, right? But people are thinking about the limit going to infinity and the, and the degrees being the same. This one would just be one half because you would say, oh, I'm going to plug in zero. And zero plus one over zero plus zero plus two is one half. So just be careful, right? It's different if you're going to zero versus going to infinity. Here, we could do some factoring and canceling. I can factor out an x from x squared plus x and get the limit as x goes to zero of x squared over a factor of an x, x times, well, I have x times x times x plus one. And now, x squared and x squared cancel out. So I have the limit as x goes to zero of one on top over x plus one on the bottom. 
And then I can finally plug in zero for X and get one over zero plus one, which is one. So my real words of wisdom for the end of class are just be careful. Make sure you are actually paying attention to what X is approaching, whether it's zero or a number or infinity or negative infinity, and think about what's going on. Um, we'll definitely talk more about limits on Thursday.